I want to introduce you to Joe Wright, who's been an astronomer for many years. He is on staff at the Seward Observatory, Observatory at the University of Arizona in Tucson. His passion for astronomy took roots as a teenager while camping at the H. Rowe Bartle Scout Reservation under dark skies when he shared his telescope. His passion continued into adulthood when he joined the um, Astrological Society of Kansas City in 1997. He became the Powell Observatory Director in 2000 and President in 2004. Uh, in 2005, Mr. Wright became the operations manner of the, Wart I have trouble with this, Wartowski Observatory, Wartowski <laughs> Observatory at UMKC. And in 2016, he was uh, flew missions on NASA's Sophia Observatory, and he did share those with us here at McContinent. Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Just a moment. There we go. Yeah, dude. Well, uh, thank you for joining us here in, in the room and also on the meeting. Okay, Joe. And an introduction, Cheryl. Have, having a little sound problem here. You're you're cutting out just a little bit. You got your your uh, your. I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'm turning unmuted. Off. Okay. Okay. Now earlier, I think they couldn't hear when she was stuck here in the building. All of a sudden, you're, you're you're cutting in and out. You know what? Hmm. Just a moment. You know what? You want to use these? I can. Uh, let's, oh, here, let's try this. Okay. It was working fine during the testing, but okay. That's going to let me do. That's the first time this has ever happened. Wait a minute. Um, yeah, I guess I'll have to use Wait, the headphones. You're coming. You're, you know what, Joe? I think you're, it's coming in. Okay, let me try. You want to say good testing? One, two, three. Uh, testing. I did not study for this test. You're good. Okay. Yeah. It's coming in. It's coming in better. All right. Yeah. And um, also, they might get reverberation through the, your microphone over there. Um, all right. So, um, I really do appreciate the Midcontinent Public Library system for having these talks on the eclipse. We've done them in 2016 and 2017 to try to uh, get people uh, enthused about going out. And I know Cheryl has already given an introduction of some of the things I've done. And so I can just kind of breeze past these. These were basically what I'm affiliated with. The Vorkachevsky Observatory is at UMKC and it's open free to the public. Uh, this is a picture of Sophia. This is what I flew missions on, a NASA aircraft. And uh, for the people there in the room, they can see the astronaut's jacket I was um, given for that and then Stewart Observatory in um, Tucson. But the WARCO, we call it WARCO for short, is at UMKC. And you'll find me there many uh, Friday nights because I'm the operations manager. This is open free to the public May through October on Friday nights. There's no reservation needed. You can go um, uh, to the UMKC website and find more out about it. There are There's free parking in the parking garage just south of the building. It's at top of Royal Hall. And basically we have the handmade telescope of Workachevsky that Stanley Workachevsky made for his wife that's 16 inches in diameter. And in the smaller picture up here, you can see the 14 that we have up there, 14 inch diameter. And back here we have a 10 inch. So, uh, and we actually do pick up, uh, we've seen all the planets but Pluto there. We've seen Uranus and Neptune even. In fact, you can even tell they're a planet. You can see the round shape and the color of them. But the 16 inch, they're the big one, gives the most spectacular views of solar system objects I think you will find in the entire um, area. Um, I was Powell Observatory Director for uh, a few years down at uh, Lewisburg, but this mirror is just a little bit better for a solar system. Powell has darker skies, so you get to see the faint objects. So let's get right into why we're here tonight. All right. Why we're doing these is hopefully, hopefully to educate people uh, about how to safely see the uh, uh, eclipse, uh, give you some ideas where you can go, also some safety tips, and just some general information and a little science about the sun, because it is the star that our solar system was created from. Now, I can't give you any single spot to go to. All right, you've seen pictures of the eclipse path. 
And you're going to have to do some searching on your own for you to decide if you want to see it in totality. And so for the people here in the Kansas City area, who remembers where the Detroit Tigers were, or I'm sure Detroit Lions were during the Super Bowl game? They were at home. So that's the difference between totality and 99.9%. Either you're in the big game or you're not. And 999 is still enough of the sun to harm your eyes, but you don't see the corona that comes out during totality. So these times that I have here are just rough estimates because it's all gonna depend on where you go. You go to the Southwest, it's gonna be earlier. You go to the Northeast, it's gonna be later. So you have to make up your own mind. And I've, for the people online, I will be putting in the chat some of the websites I've gone to to get information for this, especially the, the maps, if you haven't already done that. All right, so where to go see it? Uh, how does it happen? A little science. Uh, what types of eclipses? There's several, there's three different types of eclipses, two solar and one lunar. Uh, where can I observe it? How do I observe it safely? And what do you need? And some don'ts actually. All right, so a little bit of science. If somebody asks you a bit, how far can you see, what's the farthest you can see during the daytime? Think to yourself, what would your answer be? I hope you say 93 million miles because you can see the sun in daylight. So that's the farthest you can see during the daytime. All right, so these are our main characters, right? The sun, the earth, and the moon. The sun is roughly uh, 860,000 miles across. The Earth is, let's call it 8,000 miles, makes math easy. And the moon, we'll call it 2,000 miles across. And if you remember back from uh, fractions, anytime, oh, anytime you had the same number over the numerator and the denominator, it came up one. So because of the distance of the moon from the Earth and the sun from the Earth, that becomes nearly a one-to-one -one ratio, and we get the total solar eclipse. Then the other planets don't have it like we have it. They have eclipses, but nothing like the corona that we see. Because you start thinking about Jupiter and Saturn, how far are they away from the moon, uh, the sun, and how large are their moons? There are really some big moons out there. Here's a little diagram, a little bit of our sun. Um, sunspots you're familiar with hearing about. Now, recently, there have been sunspots larger than the size of the Earth, and you can see them without a telescope, but you need your solar eclipse glasses to see it. So take care of them, because periodically, there are sunspots that you can see without a telescope or a pair of binoculars. We have the core. The core is where the fusion takes place, all right? It takes a temperature of 27 million degrees to do this. And then it decreases as you go out at what we call the surface. There's no true surface of the sun. It's not like you can walk on it. But we have the photosphere and the chromosphere. And then you'll hear about solar flares and prominences. The main thing, though, is the convection zone. Think of a boiling part of water that the cooler water at the top sinks down and gets heated up, comes back up to the top. And what happens if you were building, uh, boiling a large pot of coffee, pot of coffee, and put a saucer on top of it, that saucer would be just a little bit uh, cooler than the water around it. And if you're doing a thermal image, it would be darker. That's what happens with sunspots. Also, the sun rotates, because it's a gas ball, from the equator to both poles, it rotates at different speeds going around. It's just not one speed going all the way around. So sunspots towards the north and south pole will spin at a different rate than the ones towards its equator zone. And believe it or not, the time it takes for the photon to leave the core and get to our eyes on Earth could be up to a million years because of the density of the sun is so great that it takes that long for the photons and the bounce around and actually it'll leave the surface of the sun. And a solar flare, if it came our way, that would be bad news. 
right? That could knock out uh, power stations and stuff, kind of like what happened in the 90s up in Southeast Canada and Northeast United States. You remember that the power went out because of the electricity induced into the electric lines by the solar activity caused power stations to shut down to protect themselves. Now we can actually look at the sun and just about the main groups of sun uh, wavelengths of light because to astronomers, light is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And these are, as you can see on the bottom left, some images taken in different wavelengths of light from infrared to X-ray that we can pick out different features that show up on the sun or its corona. Here you can see the animation of sunspots where the loop of the magnetic field goes out of one side of the sunspot, let's say the positive to the negative, all right? And the, electric, the, the magnetic field around those lines are so strong that that's why they loop out. Now, if you're looking straight at a prominence, you're not gonna see it because it's gonna be a straight line. But when that prominence rotates around to the edge of the sun, You'll see it as these loops, and I've measured some of them with the telescopes I've used at home that have been up to 100,000 miles across and 50,000 miles high. Well, these are really huge features that we can actually see with special telescopes. Your glasses that you have for their solar eclipse will not show this. It has to be in a particular wavelength. And then we have... Um, satellites looking at them. In the previous uh, couple slides, you saw a satellite. We have what's called the Solar Dynamic Observatory, which is, there are two satellites out in orbit that look at the sun. And since they're apart, like our eyes are apart, we can see them in stereo and actually have like a 3D image. Recently, you've heard about the Parker Solar Probe that was launched a few uh, years ago that is stationed about a million miles away from the sun. It's studying it. And you can go to uh, NASA's web pages for these instruments and download images from today and take a look at the sun in different wavelengths of light. You can see the prominences. You can see if there's any flares, any other kind of features. So it is a dynamic sun that we have, and we're pretty happy that we actually live in the Goldilocks spot to have our type of environment. Now, the picture on the left animation is actually what we would, let's call it the solar surface. This is the granulars that we see when we're looking through uh, the sun uh, magnified, that it's that churning pot of boiling water. And that's what it kind of looks like uh, as we're looking at it with some of our telescopes. And you can actually see on the one in the right in the different wavelength where you can see some of the solar provinces. Some of that uh, scattering are the, uh, of the speckles of uh, the image there. And the one previously is when too much uh, electromagnetic radiation is overwhelmed, the sensors on that spacecraft, and it kind of wigs out. But this is going on constantly. Our sun is halfway through its life cycle of 10 billion years. So it's at the 5 billion. It's in middle ages right now. So don't worry. Uh, it's going to be here way past we're gone. And now here's actually uh, animation. Actually, it's actually of the sun at the sunspot. And you can see, again, that churning around the sunspot. And that area that's black is just a little bit light, cooler than the area around it. And then are some sketch, uh, some images of sunspots on the right, on the left. And that down at the bottom, you can see there's a uh, earth put in there to give you kind of a concept of the sizes I'm talking about. You can actually take 110 of those earths and stretch it across the face of the sun. That's how wide it is compared to our planet. What are some of the other solar effects? And believe it or not, we can see some of these even in the evening time as far south as Kansas City, Aurora. Okay, we have we have it here on Earth, in the North and South Pole. Jupiter and Saturn has a roar. We've seen it on other planets. But here recently, just the past week, it was strong enough that I know New York and Chicago 
was on alert to see it, and sometimes even Kansas City. And that is the interaction of our magnetosphere with the energy coming from the sun. And it energizes because it travels. Our magnetic fields are concentrated at the poles, south of the North Pole. So that's why we get the roars at the poles. But when it's really active, like it is now, we get it as far south as Kansas City. And of course, just like there's solar eclipse excursions, there's, you know, you go to the northern latitudes, you can take trips to go see the aurora. And the different colors happen to be at the elements at the different altitudes that this has taken place in and how it's interacting with our magnetic sphere. We've actually, I think it's been about 10 years since we observed it. Uh, my wife and I, we live north of uh, Excelsior Springs and we saw aurora at our place up towards Lawson. It's rare, but it does happen. So how, why are we so lucky to get an eclipse? Well, I explained it earlier, the mathematics, here's a representation, but you say, well, the moon goes around the month, the uh, earth every month. Well, that's true, but it's not in a flat orbit that is the same every day, every month. It's actually tilted a little bit as the top uh, image shows that there's just a little bit more than five degrees incline of the moon's orbit to that of Earth's. So that's why we don't get an eclipse every single uh, month. About on average, 18 months, there's an eclipse somewhere on Earth. Now, it might not, it would be over the ocean because, you know, most of our planet is water. So a lot of times it happens over the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. And it also happens at the pole regions. You can actually go, there have been excursions to watch total solar eclipse at the pole. And what happens, it just skirts along the horizon. You don't see the sun go up or down during that time. If thinking of the, you know, the time of the midnight sun, as you may have heard. And here's the animation of what happens. Our moon blocks out a certain percentage. It's about 110 miles. It's not very wide, so 100, not even more than 125 miles is the path of totality. That's why so many people, especially in 2017 and this year, are gonna be traveling to see the eclipse because it's very rare for us. Now, you've heard Brian Busby and the other meteorologists in Kansas City talk about, oh, we're gonna have a super moon. Every year we have a super moon. Sometimes we have a super, super moon, you know? That's because the orbit is not a perfect circle either. It goes in and out around the Earth. So sometimes it's farther away at apogee and closer at perigee. And so instead of having the moon cover the sun like you're stacking two dimes, sometimes the moon covers the sun um, as putting the dime on top of the penny. And that's called an annular eclipse. It's not total. So there's no safe time to watch these eclipses. And there was one here in this, uh, earlier this year that people watched. Um, they had to travel for it, but there was an annular eclipse. That's just another animation of it. All right. Uh, oh. So 2026 will be the next time that North America will see an annual eclipse. And if you want to look even farther in the future, you can actually do a search for NASA, Goddard, uh, Space Flight Center, and Eclipse. And there's a whole web page that will tell you uh, the eclipse schedule for hundreds of years into the future. I think it goes by decades that you can actually open up and look at. Here is a series of collage of photos taken in 2012 of an annual eclipse out in Utah. Again, no safe time to take your glasses off and look at this. All right, little history. Our ancestors weren't that bright. The only people that really had education were the ruling people and the clergy, the monks and priests and stuff. 
All right. So if the moon covered up the sun, it was an omen. You know, the king's going to die. We're going to be conquered and invaded. The crops are going to fail. We're going to be flooded out. And this was recurring until we got understanding, especially in, during the Renaissance uh, times when we started building science. Uh, actually, the Chinese have the longest record of solar eclipses in history. You know, there was times um, mm -hmm. that there, I have some tap, uh, some actually images coming up were that was put in tapestries and stuff. Um, and they had their own mythology that this would happen. And every civilization, every culture has their own mythology of the moon, the sun, the stars, and the constellations. Every one uh, set of people around the world have their own mythology through time. You know, wolf-like giant, skull, uh, sun hoping to devour it. And so... You know, the moon was eating away at the sun, these kind of things. Even the Chippewa Indians uh, shot flaming arrows at the sun, hoping to rekindle the flames of the sun. So every culture has had their own stories about these things. And again, uh, throughout history, the lower left is back in uh, Homer and us. He talked about the... In, um, I forgot to separate the date there, April 16th, and it was 1178 BC about an eclipse. And that artwork on the left shows people going mad during a total eclipse. All right. Hollywood, you know, how many uh, movies that can you think of about astronomical phenomena? Armageddon, Lady Hawk with Michelle Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, Rudyard Howard, and um, Matthew Broderick, where uh, the sun and moon played a, a role that oh, uh, Rudyard Howard was a wolf that came out at night, and Michelle Pfeiffer was a hawk that flew during the daytime, and the only uh, time that they could come together and break the curse of the bishop was during a total eclipse. And then on the one up in the upper, upper left-hand corner, uh, it's not a very good image, but Bing Crosby, the Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's court. They were getting ready to, to execute him. And he said, I'm going to make the sun go away. And that's how he kept from being executed. So it's been around for quite a while. And here is uh, artwork from 1840 of uh, uh, Chinese observers looking at uh, objects. It looks like the sun, cover the moon covering the sun. Now, uh, little safety thing we talk about eye safety they did not know this even during the time of galileo it damaged his eyes because he looked at the sun because they didn't know this it's only been you know let's call it recent history in the last several hundred years that's understood that the damage that the sun can do by looking at it through instruments So there's why I was talking about they have uh, records, you know, of uh, for 4,000 years. And also, if you were the astrologer back then, astronomer to the king, and you were wrong, off with your head. Like um, uh, High and Ho there, they uh, failed to predict an eclipse. So they were beheaded. I'm glad it's not that way this with meteorologists now. Now, there's been some historical um, proving out uh, experiments during eclipses. We have uh, Albert Einstein and Sir Arthur Eddington, and what they were wondering was, can the gravity of the sun alter the path of light? And to prove relative, uh, relativity and his theory, they actually had expeditions to go down, I believe it was South uh, Africa, and observe an eclipse and measure the position of a star because they knew where it would be without the sun in the way that they can measure this very accurately. So they went down with all their equipment and actually they got there, I think six months to a year ahead of time they left to be there to test everything for the time of the eclipse that they can actually take photographic records of it back then. And that would have been on 
glass photographic plates, not on film. So when are the next eclipses going to happen? Well, we know, what is it, 2025? I mean, 2044 is going to be the next one over the United States. 2045, there it is, up here. Okay, the next one has to be crossing again. Probably uh, mid-California come across the Midwest and go out towards the Southeast in 2045. You can go to that a uh, website I talked about earlier doing a search for Goddard's uh, Space Flight Center and their Eclipse page. And you can actually look up the details of that right now, and it will tell you what they predict everything will be as far as duration when it starts and, and, and ends that far in advance. And I think that that's the earliest one for across the United States. You can see up in the upper right, I uh, talked about, look how many of them going across the water that we don't get to see, unless you go out on a cruise ship. There are some people right now that are on a cruise out this away, okay, for 2024. And I was just notified by a friend that's on a cruise ship that now they are predicting that they are gonna be clouded out on that cruise ship for the eclipse. So you really have to take a gamble on where you're gonna go. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there goes short animation. Starting out in the mid-Pacific. Came up through Baja, California, and Mexico. Up into Texas. Arkansas. Missouri. Illinois, Ohio, on up, and on out, uh, Nova Scotia and stuff, up in the far northeast of the North American continent. So we can pass these up, it, just to repeat the same thing. Now, if you want to actually predict some or see what they are like for yourself, this image is actually taken from software that you can download for um, PCs, window-based computers, MacBook, and Unix. This is called Stellarium, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. It's a free download planetarium software. And all I did was set it for Kansas City at the time of the eclipse. And I wanted to see what would we be seeing if it was total. And just like in 2017, we can see that during totality, um, Jupiter will be shining, and so will Venus. And in fact, during 2017, around here, you might have seen some of the brighter stars come out. So this is a way that you can actually uh, mimic an eclipse for any location that you're interested in that there's an eclipse path. Plus, if you want to do some observing at night, you have the planetarium software now that will show you the stars, the planets, and the constellations that is a very good, um, so I see that they can't hear, is this true? That's all. Okay, that's it, all right, good, good. So download this and, and use it. Now, if you remember back to one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think it was the first one where Harrison Ford said, well, X never marks the spot, but it actually did in uh, the museum or library they were at to break through the floor, this X is over Carbondale, Illinois. They get to experience two eclipses within seven years. The total totality passes over them, just like it did in 2017, just like it will do this coming Monday. So they, people around that area are in the right spot. All right, let's get into some planning. But before I want, I uh, want to mention this before I forget it. If you have children, you can do things with them to do uh, during the eclipse or before or after. Just uh, Google or search on the internet for eclipse chalk art. And it's very simple. All you can get some construction paper and cut out a circle 
about three or four inches in diameter, hold it on the construction paper, and you can take the chalk and mark over it. Then you remove it and you have a total solar eclipse with the corona. And there's some other things you can do if you're gonna travel, uh, especially if you're traveling to, to, to totality, you can do some simple experiments. All right, now I know there's a lot of text here. I don't expect you to read it quickly. I, I will mention some of this. And some of this is just good common sense that you already know, because you've taken road trips before. You know, um, go with friends and family, go with caravan with each other, get together and pick a spot. There's still time. Now I know that hotel prices can be really pricey uh, in some of these places, but maybe there's some other accommodations you can find or find a relative that live close enough to the center line that you can go visit them then move, uh, then travel on over to the center line. And again, I can't tell you any single time when things will start because I don't know I don't know where you're going to be at. I haven't actually nailed down where I'm going to be at because I'm waiting for the forecast for Monday uh, morning. Um, if you can, beat the crowds. Try to get there early. Um, fill up your gas tank. There's a lot of people going to be on the road this weekend. Monday and Monday afternoon. Make sure you have snacks with you, all right? Uh, you probably have emergency kit in your car already, you know, uh, flares, uh, uh, fix a flat, that kind of stuff in case you do have a road uh, problem. Um, have your maps ready, you know, detailed maps. You can actually download Google Maps onto your phone or computer without after uh, and you can use them without the internet if you do it beforehand. I just learned about this recently. I did not know you can do that. Uh, check with local people. Where's the, where's some places to go? Because basically any flat spot where people can pull a car onto is going to be uh, packed. We're talking Walmart parking lots, church parking lots, schools, um, different areas. And also you can find out, is there a place you can go to where they're doing something that you can still get into as far as activities? And be prepared for the cell service to be overloaded like it was in 2017. Okay. First and foremost, be safe with looking at the sun. Have your glasses, take care of them, put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in an envelope, keep them. They're not gonna deteriorate right away. I'm still using some that are a couple of years old, but the only time it's safe to take off the glasses is when you're watching the sun and you see the moon going across it and you see that last blink of what they call the diamond ring and then it goes dark and you don't see anything, then take your glasses off. That's when you're gonna see the corona, so the solar corona. And it is really an amazing thing to see. We don't understand why the corona is a million or two million degrees compared to the photosphere of the sun, the chromosphere. There, we don't know what the mechanism is that's making that area around the sun so hot. And I have an image coming up. We can simulate an eclipse, but it doesn't get down close enough to the surface like a total solar eclipse to see um, the, the big part of the corona where it comes off the surface, so to speak. Don't do any direct viewing of the sun. Sure, playing baseball, driving, we actually accidentally get a glimpse of the sun. Just don't stare at it, all right? It will damage your eyes. Keep an eye on your children and grandchildren. You wanna make sure that they're doing stuff safely and have things for them to do uh, when they get bored. Um, you know, duration looking at it. You don't, you know, share your glasses if you don't have enough for everybody. Just don't risk this, your eyes on taking a look without your glasses on. 
But during totality, and even if you're, let's say you're at 99%, 95%, look around and see any changes that you can pick up. Did it get darker? Does it feel a little cooler? Are the birds chirping more? You know, take a look at nature. What's happening during totality or close to totality? See how things change. You can go online and make solar viewers, okay? Some of you might remember what a pinhole camera is that we used to make with oatmeal boxes. You can do the same thing and turn it into a solar viewer where you don't have to look at the sun directly. You can project it onto a cardboard. And there are several different websites. Just look up uh, making a solar eclipse viewer. There are several of them out there and it will tell you what you need. You know, you're gonna cut a hole at one end I, I'd still say, don't just use a pinhole, cut a little larger hole about, you know, a quarter inch diameter or half inch, and then put aluminum foil over it. So when you take the needle and poke a hole through aluminum foil, you have a very nice crisp hole. Instead of if you poke a hole through cardboard, you have the fibers and stuff. The aluminum makes a really nice hole. And that's what we used to make cameras out of. And then you can put um, you can put uh, a sheet of paper over the back end and see the sun projected on it. Or what they're doing here is they're making like a you look at one side and the sun comes in this way away from you to your sun's to the back and like a, using a cereal box and you're looking into the box and then on one side is the hole where the sunlight comes in through through that pinhole back to the other side of the uh, cereal box. But you need you know, a piece of white paper back there um, or gray so you can actually see the image because there are sunspots right now. Uh, traffic and transportation. All right. People are going to be scrambling to get to some place. Watch out for these other people on the road uh, that aren't going to be courteous. They're not going to care if they cut you off. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, have a full tank of gas because who knows um, what could, you know, how places will be just packed with people and run out of gas or, or not even be able to service everybody. Make sure you have a little bit of cash with you in case you need to stop and get something. Who knows if banks will even be open on Monday along the path of totality. There are places like that that are going to completely shut down. Um because I can remember my sister calling when she left our place in 2017 that I-35 up by Liberty was just packed. They weren't moving. It took her an hour and a half to get home into Sugar Creek, which is normally a 25-minute drive. So here's how we can simulate using a coronagraph. You can see that round disc on the right is actually blocking out the sun, and then that circle there in the center represents the size of what they're not seeing. So from that white circle out to that edge of the red circle, that's what they're missing because we can't recreate it artificially like the moon does. The moon does it perfectly. And it takes special equipment. I mean, it's a stacked filter that does this. And these things aren't cheap. But you can see, you know, a promise leaving uh, the sun spewing that energy out to Earth. Imagine that coming towards us. I mean, out in space, but if it, hopefully it doesn't come towards us. Again, we've probably seen this between here and television too many times. But what would be nice to be out where it was clear on the ocean, where you can see to the horizon? They're all different kind of maps. I'm gonna show you three different maps because I haven't found one map that shows me everything that I wanted to know like in 2017. This one shows basically on the two left and right edge over here, okay, on the left side too, it shows you the percent of coverage along that band, all right? So you can see here's totality, the path of totality, once you leave either one of these red lines right here, now you're into a partial eclipse, and that tells you how far, how much of a coverage you will have. 
right? So people down in the Florida, the 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 keys and stuff, they're only going to have about forty five percent of an eclipse. So the closer you get to the path, the more coverage you have. To once you get into a point, now you're going to be in totality. All right, if you're right here, and you only get twenty seconds of totality, what if you went, you know? 40 miles more, and now you got three and a half to four minutes. What a difference that little short distance will make. Here's uh, another map, same difference. Like I said, these three maps, I've had to use all two different maps to get the information I wanted. Uh, and I, I have the links that I'll put in the, in the chat here in a bit at the end. But you can pick a spot on these maps and you pick it, it will tell you the start time. Now, if you pick um, downtown Kansas City, it's gonna have start of the partial, then it's gonna have the uh, maximum. And when I say maximum, I didn't say totality, it's the maximum coverage you will have at a time. Then it will say the end of partial. I didn't say total eclipse, because there isn't any, but it will tell you the start and end and it takes a couple of hours for this thing to go all the way through, but only totality is for about four and a half minutes at the best spot. And this map, and I'll show you a closer view. I just want to, uh, so you can actually have a nice uh, clear view of the path from Mexico up here in the extreme Northeast of North America. The thing I liked about this map that it was clear to look for the roads and the cities and towns underneath it. And some of these uh, websites you can actually print off for your state or whatever state you pick. But generally, wherever you pick on, on online, I can't do it here in the, in the presentation until I end it, you pick on, on it, click a spot, and it will tell you the information about it. Here's a, a closer one of this. When I started down here in Texas, going up through Missouri here. So you can really nicely see, you know, and actually I like this one because it clearly shows where there's, you know, uh, state parks or here in Missouri, we have the Mark Twain Forest. So you can really see where there's state parks, uh, city parks, if you get closer, national forest or lakes even that, uh, you might want to go towards for totality. And this eclipse, the one thing about this one, the path goes past or over more populated areas than in 2017. Remember in 2017, it was to the northeast of Kansas City and the southeast of St. Louis. Okay? It didn't go over us. That's why there's more people now, because look at Dallas. Fort Worth. I don't even know what the population is of that place, but you know it's got to be a madhouse on Monday. And also, my feeling is the farther you go to the Northeast, you start getting into more population density. Where if I, I plan on being down here in Southeast Missouri to Arkansas watching it, where it doesn't have the population density like it would have up in Ohio, Indiana, and of course, Illinois is going to have a lot of people. So that's just my personal feeling, is we're not going to be alone. And here's like just reiterating uh, what I said a moment ago, parks, city, county, state, national, schools, civic centers. I'm sure there's going to be someplace a Walmart parking lot is going to be packed with people. Mm -hmm. You know it. Is there a dollar general? How many dollar generals are across the, the path of totality? That'd be an interesting question. All right, oh, and that's a, I forgot I had this in here, another pinhole projector. You can take a card and hold it above it and make your own pinhole projector. For those in Kansas City, this is on top of the observatory that I showed you earlier at UMKC, where in 1974, they were doing a projection method. Okay, it's coming down through the telescope. There's no filter. And now they're projecting it onto this white, surface and you can see it was a partial eclipse so unsafe now oh 
the don'ts, the quiz in the lower left-hand corner, uh, which view is safe to be looking at without your glasses on? Of course, the one in the lower right, right here. Okay, that's the only time you can take your glasses off. And then these others will damage your eye. Also, don't look through anything because these are only gonna magnify the power of the sun. Some of us, heavens forbid I did it. Uh, how many of us have taken a magnifying glass and started the fire on a piece of paper or something or burnt an ant when we were kids? Do that with your eye now with the telescope or binoculars. That gives you the kind of idea of the power that can happen, even with your binoculars. Astronomers, we put the filter on the front end, okay? If you have a telescope and it has one of these little filters that says sun or solar, the best thing you can do with it, take it outside, set it on a rock, get a larger rock and smash it because they're unsafe. You're screwing that into the bottom of the eyepiece just inches from your eye and all the energy will come down through the telescope and be concentrated onto that thing and it could crack. And there are, uh, there's a couple of videos on YouTube that this gentleman was out in the desert uh, imaging and he heard something and it was one of these cracking. And when I was a little kid, I didn't know this. So I usually carry mine around to tell people don't use it. We always like to have our filters up front and block it before it comes in the telescope. Okay, so these are sp solar filters. I'll be honest, I don't know if you can go buy any online and I guess Amazon can ship it overnight. You can actually make filters that go over your binoculars. Okay, this is another fancy solar projection uh, system. And this is uh, one that they sell that's about $350. Here's someone took, don't risk your digital camera, either a DSLR like this here or your cell phone. Don't tr trust electronics in it not to be damaged. They took a piece of cardboard. You can buy this film and make a filter for your uh, camera. And this here is a special uh, solar filter camera. A this is actually a solar telescope that shows those prominences like I talked about. Now, Somebody asked me the other day, I'm not making this up, can I get one of those balloons at Walmart, that Mylar balloon, and use it as a filter? No. Even though they call it Mylar, it's not balloon material. It's better than a welder's mask. All right? So uh, look online if you want to get any. Uh, see if they can overnight it. Today's Tuesday. They could probably get it to you in two days through Amazon or somebody. Okay, I already mentioned what to do during the eclipse. Notice if you feel any difference in the air chip temperature. Look around. Oh, and if you do go to totality, what does it look like? I've heard a lot of different descriptions of how eerie it looked. All right. That you know it's daytime. You see the sun up there, but this the land has a cast over it, a shadow. Also, if you're lucky enough to be somewhere up high on a mountain, or it would have been even like on City Hall if it was passing over City Hall, downtown Kansas City, or Sears Tower. I guess it's not called Sears Tower anymore, uh, whatever. Um, you can actually see the shadow moving over the country, down through the valleys and stuff. And people actually have seen this and, and videotaped it. And I have some coming up. All right. And I don't say this lightly. Pictures do not do but justice. I've been in astronomy a long time, but last 2017 was the first total I've seen in my life. And I didn't want to travel. I got to stay at our place with our family and watch it. And it was something else. Ron L. Williams from Channel 5 Meteorologist was there. Laura Mortz's husband was a videographer there. And uh, Betsy Webster. They all were up there to see it in totality. Because some of the places around the city got clouded out. So here's a collage. And that's all these are going to be some images to whet your appetite. 
Again, I almost used a laser pointer. You can't see that online. Remember, this is hotter than what you would call the surface here. This is upwards of 2 million degrees compared to this. And we don't know why. Why is it? Look at those sunspots. Now, those could be see, seen without a telescope. And I am sure that this, the series of pictures were not magnified a whole lot like through a telescope to have the sun that size. Also, the foreground tells me of the, the trees. Here's the shadow captured from the International Space Station. Another collage from beginning of the eclipse through totality to the end of the eclipse. And yes, when you take a picture with your camera or cell phone, that thing is going to look really small. But if you're at totality and capture any of the corona, you've got something that you say you did. Fred Espinac. He's retired from Goddard Space Flight Center. He's the person that makes up all the telescope, all the uh, eclipse charts for NASA. Maybe some of you got to come to UMKC when uh, I hosted him back in 2017, talking about the eclipse. Oh, if you're in totality, also take a look. This is the diamond ring. Okay, just before the sun goes out, before the lights go out in Georgia, that's what you're going to see, all right? And then it's going to go dark. And then you take your glasses off, and then you see the corona. Also, you might see some other things, okay? Now, go back to that um, simulated image with the coronagraph of the corona. Now look at what the moon does. Think of how much of this, if we were using the coronagraph, would not be seen. And this is probably a background star that we can see through the corona. Fred's picture, again, you see this red up here and along here? Remember those prominences, those loops, of what we call plasma coming off the sun? That's what we're seeing there. Also, you can get to see little bright spots that's because, you know, the, the, the mountains and the valleys on the moon, it's not a smooth surface. So it's going to have some, uh, um, what I want to call it, undulations along the edge. There's those prominences that I was talking about. And I actually took a look through one of my telescopes and it was, I wish I could have had a way of, to capture it, but I didn't have time because I was part of a research station. But I got to see that with an 8-inch telescope. It was amazing. There's the diamond ring. And now you can see what I'm talking about. There's still going to be little low spots. But when that goes out, and then you take your glasses off. This one is, someone had a filter on it. Oh, yes, there are air flights right now that will be going along the path. It was mentioned on the news, you know, they have to clear this with the FAA. You know, they're going to have all, several airplanes traveling the path of totality. You'd have to be in the SR-71 to keep up. All right. A regular jet will not keep up with it. And, my, and from what I understand that, um, a person was on one of these flights that did not know there was a solar eclipse happening. And he saw all these people get up out of their seats and make, you know, a hoopla. And he's like, what is going on? Then they, hey, come here, take a look out the window. Then he understood and wasn't so scared. Up on a mountain. Seeing it at a uh, sunset. Now, that one, they did a little photo editing, and there's a thing called Earthshine, and it won't happen so much during the eclipse, 
but during uh, the moon phases, you can actually see a little bit of the moon from this from the reflection of the light off of the earth back onto the moon. And back to that chalk art, when you if you do it with kids, have them not only use the white, use some different colors of chalk to have them get some color in the corona. And an animation. Yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't think, think about this earlier. earlier. How, How long does it take us to see this image? image? takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to get to earth. So you're seeing something eight minutes old. Plus, if the photons are a million years older. All right. Uh, any questions online or uh, anything? Oh. We, we have one question, Joe. Where can we get glasses? <laughs> uh, well... well Actually, if you were here tonight, I'm handing some out, my wife and I, that I got from JPL. That's one of the uh, entities I uh, work with. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory sent me some. I understand. What was the store you said? I, I was at the Hy-Vee on Culver Road in Lee Summit. They probably had two, three hundred of them. And I was in another store getting gas, and I saw they had uh, packs of them there at the counter. So check some of your local... Um, stores and gas stations they may have some would i say it is worth traveling to see totality if you can yes if you've never okay i saw it in 2017 i'm going to try and go i plan to go again um this weekend and for me it's quite a challenge because i'm just coming off of a uh, spinal injury so i want to go see this because I don't know how much I'll be able to travel in the future. And, you know, 2045 or 44 is, you know, it's 21 years away. You know, I'm going to catch the one that I know I can. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go to southeast Missouri, northeast, uh, northeast Arkansas, that kind of area. Because uh, right now, and I don't trust any forecasts that are more than uh, 10 minutes old. <laughs> uh, long range forecasts don't mean a whole lot to me. And right now they're talking about though uh, Texas being clouded out. So I plan on going, being where I can get somewhere in time to see it. Now, don't remove your glasses at the diamond stage. Basically, that's the last point when you see it blink out and you can't see anything. And you can only do this where you're in the path of totality. Then take the glasses off. The corona is safe. Okay, remember, that's going out the sides. But if you see something bright, that's not the time. Um, if you have glasses and it's clear tomorrow, go outside and look at the sun with your glasses on. Maybe you see some sunspots. You know, you know, practice if you've never done this before, before you actually go to the eclipse. All right. But that that diamond ring is the last glint of light typically that you'll see brightly before uh, it goes into totality. So if it gets, you see something bright, and all of a sudden it goes dark, and you you know the real clue is gonna be? When everybody around you starts making a lot of noise, okay, because it's not gonna be quiet if you're with other people. There's gonna be a lot of cheering going on. And you, then you know, hey, I better take off my glasses. We had one person ask, uh, she didn't quite catch your name at the beginning. It's uh, Joseph Wright, who's been doing programs with us since the 2017 eclipse on eclipses and other uh, astrological phenomena. Yep. Astronomical stuff is what I like to do. So the uh, person is asking, is it safe for the dog? To, you know, there really isn't a lot of data because we don't know if dogs know to look up at the sun. Okay. If you're worried about it, you know, um, if you can keep them inside. But really, I don't think an animal is really going to look up and say, where did that big ball of light go to? Um, if you do see them, you know, don't have them, don't stand in the path and getting your dog's attention where they have to look up at you with the sun behind you. Now that I would be concerned about. But just normally, our dogs, cats, you know, animals of all kind, they're out there every day and they're safe. 
So during this time, I don't think it's really going to be a problem. And I know uh, uh, when we're done with the questions, I think Cheryl's got something to say, and then I can go actually um, move off of the PowerPoint and go to some of the interactive maps and put those links into the chat room. Okay. Uh, really, the only thing I have to say is I have included a link to the survey, and I'm going to put that in there one more time. And I'll uh, let you go ahead and finish. I'm happy that you joined online and here in the classroom, or I mean, in the library. So first I want to do is, actually, I can share this at the same time. Change what I'm going to share. That did not come up. Oh, so you're seeing it, right? The map? Okay, so now I need to drag this over. And we got to change this. So I got, let me stop the PowerPoint. Okay. Because I'm projecting through a LCD uh, projector here. So let me go ahead and get that taken care of. All right. Now I can bring it up. All right. So are you still seeing the map, Cheryl? Yes. Okay. I, and on, on the screen. Okay. So this is one of the maps I used. And I'm sorry I can't get... Um, the uh, Zoom stuff. I'm used to using three screens, so I'm just using one with the laptop tonight. All right. So uh, let's see. Here's the website. Let me go ahead and let's get rid of that. Put it in the chat real quick. I still have that up. And every time you do something different, it moves stuff around. Oh, there it is. It's got to be on here. Some oh, there it is. Yep. Yeah, okay, it took it off my screen. All right, so here's this one that I'm on. So this is the one that I said I like because I can use the roller mouse. All right, and it's, to be honest, it's a little bit difficult with me right now. All right, so this one is the one I said I can actually see into uh, through the path. So the blue line, of course, is the best spot to be, the center line. That's what's going to be max. That's where you're going to have the most totality. Now, there's actually one sweet spot, and I don't know where it's at, that's going to be the perfect spot. Okay, but you're only going to lose a second or so. So along this path, the blue line, as you move away from the blue line each side and goes towards the red, that means the time you have of total eclipse decreases till you get to a point where you step across the line and it, oop, you're out of it. But now I can actually see, you know, here's uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas down here. Okay. Here's uh, Wachita National Forest. It cuts right through here. You know, I don't know how wooded it is. Do I want to be in a place that's got, you know, a couple 200, 300 foot tall ponderosa pines that I can't see the sky? Not likely. But they usually have some open areas and parking areas. So, you know, I'm going to be uh, looking through northeast Arkansas and, and southeast uh, Missouri. And the nice thing about this, that if you can actually pick some spots and uh, take a look as you're doing this, you can also see the side roads that go through it. That's why I like this one more than one of the other ones. So what happens if we pick a spot? Let's go up here in northern, northeast uh, Arkansas. All right, let's see where we're at here. All right. So I'm going to come down here, see if there's any uh, towns, hamlets, whatever you want to call them. Here is a road. Okay, let's see what it is right here at this point. If I pick... Pick a spot here. Okay, it's going to come up. Now, this map doesn't tell me. It only tells me the information for the closest town. All right. Well, that's not very good. So that's when I go to this other website. Now, did I lose it with you, Cheryl? So is this one still showing? Or Okay. So you got this one up. 
All right. So this one now, if I pick a spot, and I'll put it in the chat, uh, here's Carbondale, all right? There's going to be, I'm sure, 100,000 people in this area. But I click on centerline. Now it tells me some information. And it also will actually put a circle for the, the round spot of the moon if I pad, zoom out of it. So it's telling me here, this is its coordinates, GPS, okay? This is its uh, latitude. This is the longitude, okay? 37 degrees north of the equator, 89 degrees west of Greenwich Meridian. It also tells me that there's four minutes and eight seconds. And this is corrected. So four minutes, eight seconds of totality. Then down here, it tells me what the event is. And there's a graphic, by the way. Okay, here's the moon. Here's the sun. This is uh, the start. This is when the moon first touches the sun. All right, you come over here. Well, we mean 5.43 in the evening. I thought this was the afternoon thing. This is, if you're no military, Zulu time or Greenwich Meridian or what we call universal time. Astronomers use the zero line that marks east and west because then we don't have to do what we're doing right now in the Midwest. Am I five hours or six hours? Are we daylight savings time or not? So whatever the time is here, if you're in the Kansas City area, subtract five hours because we're five hours now because we moved our clocks ahead. So five from 17 is 12. So at 12.43, that's at this spot, that's when the partial starts, okay? And then totality starts at, uh, let's see here, that will be, that's at one 159, okay? Five from 18, 18, 1359 hours. Then that's when total starts. Maximum total is at, uh, Two, let's see, two o'clock, a minute after two. Then it comes out of uh, end of total and then end of the eclipse. So you have to know the location you're at. Kansas City, we're five hours. Carbondale, I think, is still central time. You get too far east and you're going to have to go to Pacific time. You go too far west, you have to go into mountain time. So that's what you need to remember. And see, this didn't give me that information on the other map, but also, let's see here. Let me back out of this. And then you can actually, I'm going to close it here. But you can see it's harder to see through the path here and really uh, get down into the nuts and bolts of it. It does show it, but... Then you can start looking at for, by the way, have two spots, maybe three. If you get to a point where you can't uh, stay or you get run off, um, have another spot to go to quickly enough or if it's cloudy. So let me go ahead and I'm going to zoom out again, like I said, and put this in the chat. So that's two different maps. And I also use a regular Google map to coordinate with these. So let's see, there's Mount Vernon, that's uh, Missouri, uh, Benton. So let's see what we have here. Oh, here's the state line, All right? I think so. Yeah, because there's Kentucky state line. So and this yeah. must Arkansas. So just start looking where you want to, I think you can get from Kansas City. Think of the drive time, especially when you go through these areas. You know, the roads have a lot of switchbacks and you can't do uh, fast travel through these. You have to slow down through some of these roads. But look at the, the larger surface roads. Um, like if I was gonna go to Springfield, I could actually travel, I believe, what would I say it was last night? Uh, um, Highway 60 goes from Springfield all the way down into here 
and I can get in now to the eclipse and I can keep going and then I go straight over towards uh, the center line. So look at the roads that they have. Is it two lane or four lane? Is it gravel? And that's where you kind of have to look at the several different uh, maps. Let me put this in the chat too. This is uh, the website that I mentioned earlier that you can go look for future solar and lunar eclipses, all right? And they have them planned out for many years into the future, all right? So that's a good resource to have, especially as they get closer especially when it comes to the uh, lunar eclipses. All right, are there any other things I needed to, that was that one. And see again, it just says, this location is in the path. The, uh, see the eclipse here is total. The nearest town in our database is, I think that's Ugalala, uh, Arkansas. And then you click on this, or just Ola. Okay, you click on it, and then it doesn't. Um, wasn't going there, but I thought I'd see what they say. So I don't see anything really um, relevant. Oh, you have to agree. Maybe then it shows. Nope. Oh. All right. So it just goes into an animation. So not very useful. That's why this map. Um, like here near Donovan, it gives you the numbers. And now you can see, I talked about that path. And now you can see behind the uh, menu that I have my mouse on that it's showing the path of the sun, uh, moon shadow moving as I go up and down the times. Okay. And then... Okay, this one is from the National Solar Observatory. And it's similar to that first one I showed you. Oh, the only thing, um, I find it harder to use because then you have to use the plus and minus symbol to move in. I'm been programmed to, to use the roller mouse. I always forget that I have to do it differently. And let's see. All right. So it gives data when it starts, when totality, max, end of totality. It actually gives it for the local time. You don't have to do any calculations. So if you use this one, it gives you the local time for where you're at. So this would be a real handy one to have. And then you can always do screen captures of these and put them in a document that you can send to your phone. So those were the maps I've been using to actually, and, and this one just came up tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna back out of this one, go to its map. Oh, too far, Joe. Okay. Are there any other questions? And really, I don't think I, and, and, and that's what I had in, there's, there's a couple other slides that just showed those, those websites. websites. Okay. So like I said, it's more, more information than you care to copy <laughs> down. These, these in the uh, chat would be your best ones to go and use. All right. And you can see some of these are just derivatives of where I went farther into it. But you can see I used Eclipse 2024, Great American Eclipse, and then Eclipse dot got at Goddard Space Flight Center dot NASA to get to this one. So those are the four that I use the most. Okay, we got to thank you for the websites and their resources. Nice. And I wish there was a way that if you do go uh, to visit, to watch the totality, too bad they can't send them to the library and we put them up on a web page. That'd be kind of cool. So we got to think about that for 2044. <laughs> <laughs> Or 45, excuse me. I don't know why I keep saying 45. I'm, I'm hoping I'm retired by then. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the people in the room, there's some handouts. Um, 
we actually have a hologram of the sun that shows the sun in different wavelengths, like I showed on here. Uh, we have some eclipse glasses and some other handouts that you're welcome to. And I'm sorry that uh, the folks online, I can't uh, uh, push them through the internet to you. So uh, enjoy it and uh, come visit us at the Warco at UMKC uh, starting in May. And tell me what you saw of the eclipse and bring your pictures with you. Okay, well, I I think that's all we have for tonight. I think we've answered all the questions that we, we've got. So I'm going to say good night to everyone. Good night.